Welcome to my podcast. I'm Reagan Beshera, founder of Ollie's Accounting, a bookkeeping and payroll services firm based in the United States. I have almost a decade of small business accounting expertise to share with my clients and the business community at large. I want to help you define your beliefs and values, create better procedures in line with those values, and realize your financial agency and independence as a small business owner. Whether you've got a side hustle or a fully fledged business with a team of employees, we all share the same struggles against our limiting beliefs. Let's overcome those together by imagining new ways of doing business. Hey there, this is Reagan Mashera, host of the Money Through Ease podcast. Um, today is election day in the United States, November 8th, 2022. I just got home from voting about an hour ago and I wanted to talk about some things that have been on my mind with regards to the way that public policy has been veering in a dangerous, dangerous direction the past, you know, (laughs) decade more really, um, And I want to talk about how public policy, criminalization of certain identities, professions, actually um, intersects with the work that I do as an accountant and bookkeeper. Um, So I hope you'll enjoy what I have to say. If you um, agree with me, I'd love to hear from you. Um, You can reach me at alleaseaccounting on Instagram. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the things that I have to say. And whether you agree or disagree, it's all welcome in conversation with me. Um, and I appreciate you listening. So while I was preparing to go vote and in the process of voting, while I was researching the propositions, the amendments that were on my ballot, the folks that um, were asking for my vote in local, state, and national elections, I was just kind of considering all of the work and the research that I've done over the past couple years on um, anti-racism and capitalism and kind of unlearning some things that I have learned just by being a member of this society. Um, And for a long time, I didn't really think about how that intersected with my work as an accountant, as a bookkeeper, especially for small local businesses. And while doing that work, I realized that obviously there is a huge intersection with the work that I do, especially when I'm talking about having financial agency and having independence and how having more money, more capital, more equity allows you to create the life that you want, but also gives you um, more security and safety. I do believe that we create security and safety for ourselves with the way we think. Um, But also at the same time, there are outside forces that, you know, want to criminalize the things that some people do, quite literally want to criminalize people for simply being who they are for their identity. Um, And so all of this kind of overlaps in a way that I want to talk about. Um, I believe that supporting my small business community and empowering folks who have been historically in the margins is my way of starting the changes that I want to see on the ground floor in my community. Right after the 2016 election, um, the presidential election in the United States, um, when Donald Trump was voted into the presidency, I was told that I shouldn't worry about Trump getting elected and that I should focus more on the ripples that I can make and the good that I can do in my immediate locality. And so I'm going to do that with my expertise as an accountant, helping small businesses succeed beyond their wildest dreams. I think that this person was trying to gaslight me and reduce my feeling, my very real feelings of fear, um, which have since become realized. Um, And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. But I'm a white woman. Um, I grew up in a family that was very privileged. We didn't really have scarcity of housing or food or health care. Like, I didn't grow up feeling insecure about any of those things 
for long periods of time, if ever. Like, I always knew that my parents were going to take care of me, that we were going to have somewhere to stay, that I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from. But for too long in our country, really since before the founding of our country, Black, Indigenous, people of color, disabled people, and members of the LGBTQ plus communities have been denied access to wealth, equity, credit, property, and representation. Folks who experience one or more of these intersections have had to work 10 times harder and face more barriers to safety and abundance than I will ever know. As we saw during Trump's presidency and in the years after, public policy grows more vitriolic against these marginalized groups and seeks to criminalize identity and choice of work. My support of these communities is by doing what I do best, helping them measure growth and make more money. Today on my podcast, I'm going to talk about how public policy seeks to subvert criminalize and disenfranchise these marginalized groups, and how we can show up with more political power by exercising and growing our financial agency and independence. So on the topic of criminalizing abortion, sex work, and drugs, we're going to start by talking about abortions. According to Pew Research, who gathered data from the CDC and the Guttmacher Institute, in 2019, Of the 29 states plus D.C. that reported racial and ethnic data on abortion to the CDC, abortion seekers were made up of mostly non-Hispanic black women at 38% of that group, while 33% were non-Hispanic white women, and there were lower percentages of other races and ethnicities. Before Roe v. Wade effectively legalized abortion, which was in 1973, adoption was one of the few options to women with unwanted pregnancies or who were experiencing unwanted or untimed births. The number of adoptions nearly doubled between 1957 and 1970, and after Roe in 1973, legalizing abortion, adoption fell by 25% by 1975, so just two years later after Roe. The number of adoptions of children born to white women was 42% lower in 1975 than in 1970, according to the Guttmacher Institute. So essentially what happened after abortion was legalized was the supply of white infant children available for adoption dropped significantly. And since adoption is a capitalist, racist, and classist system in the United States, and pretty much the rest of the world as well, Adoption agencies looked elsewhere to find the resources to continue making a profit on the sale of children. Adoption is not a solution to infertility, but the system has framed it that way because the industry quite literally profits off of it. With the Dobbs decision in 2022 that pretty much overturned Roe v. Wade, Many states have effectively banned abortion or seek to criminalize people who seek out or assist with this health care service. When you criminalize people and incarcerate them, you strip their voting rights, their bodily autonomy, and their agency over their lives. Criminalizing abortion actually disproportionately affects Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color, and further marginalizes and incarcerates them. Next topic, criminalizing sex work. Sex work is the consensual exchange of sexual services for money or goods and is criminalized nearly everywhere, with the exception of work that's done in the presence of recording equipment. This means that sex workers must already have access to capital, housing, personal safety, transportation, health care, etc. So in short, they already need to have access to these things, personal agency, and bodily autonomy. Criminalizing sex work subverts the industry, resulting in the disenfranchisement of women, particularly black, indigenous, and other women of color, transgender people, gender nonconforming people, and non-binary people, disabled people, and poor people. So what do, mean, what do we mean when we say that criminalization subverts that industry? Well, people who actually do want to participate in that industry are subverted in the fact that they can't really be public about the work that they do. Um, They need to find ways around advertising in a public space, Um, you know, having clients that are 
not going to be a danger to them. And then people who are food, housing, or healthcare insecure already may turn to sex work for survival. But since this industry is subversive and taboo, and the status of that work marginalizes them and exposes them to harassment, assault, and death. So we have sex workers who can be jailed for making decisions about what they do with their bodies, causing them to not seek out health care or protection from law enforcement, even if a crime has been committed against them. No one is going to risk going to jail when they were doing their job and somebody assaulted them. And they're not going to seek out health care because doctors are going to ask questions um, and they might be reported to law enforcement. Sex workers have to get creative about how they want to report their income, if they want to have a credit score and be eligible for loans or gov government assistance. Otherwise, they may be forced to operate only with liquefiable assets and cash on hand. So there's many ways that the sex work industry is subverted, criminalized, and then, of course, if you're convicted of that as a crime, they're going to incarcerate you. And we've already talked about how that disenfranchises people. But none more so, I think, than by the drug industry. So any substance abuse or any drug use that is um, an addiction is a disease. It is a health issue. It is not a moral issue. But yet we have the drug economy, the buying and selling of drugs, has been one way to incarcerate more people and per capita in the United States, especially black people, than in any other country. And of course, this is individuals who decide to sell drugs, um, not the pharmaceutical companies who profit off of people being sick all the time. We have high incarceration rates that remove people and thus their voting power from their communities. So in my home state of Louisiana, prison populations are counted towards the district in which the prison resides. Yet, those folks in the prison don't have voting power. So prisons in low population rural areas actually grant more political power to those districts. Um, of course, incarcerating people, more people, currently means a larger workforce that you can pay little to no wages to and also coerce people into work with threat of solitary confinement, loss of privileges, and possibly longer sentences. Convictions reduce your ability to find adequate housing, work, and acceptance back into society after a sentence is served. Thus, the disenfranchisement of formerly incarcerated people cycles them back into poverty, reduces their agency and authority over their own livelihoods. This is just a few examples of the way that criminalizing identity, criminalizing work, um, is a way to disenfranchise really large groups of people in the population, subverting their authority over their own lives, um, you know, taking away their voting power, taking away, taking away their livelihood, um, you know, disinvesting in communities. So we've got criminalization of abortion, sex work, and um, people who use or sell drugs. All of this to kind of wrap up under this idea of having money and thus having power and agency over your own life, tying that back into the work that I do as an accountant. I help people record, report, you know, look at their business in a way that can help them grow to make more money because as we know, if you're showing up with more money, you're already, you're already a step ahead. You're going to have more power. Having the authority over your life and the ability to decide on what you want is something that can be taken away from any of us at any point through this process of moralizing, criminalizing, and restricting access to people based on their identity, healthcare choices, or choice of work. I'm not saying that financial independency is the end-all be-all of restoring civil rights and ending all of our problems. Sometimes it simply doesn't matter how much money you have. But the system is sure designed to favor those that do have more. Having more money means, number one, security of housing, food, health care, time for rest, time for resistance. Having more money means, number two, supporting businesses that treat their employees fairly, pay more than just a living wage, 
or deciding that you want to run your own business based on your values or these values. Having more money means number three, supporting political candidates who are going to enact public policy that protects people and communities and reinvests public funds to make spaces where everyone is welcome, supported, and has all their basic needs met and then some. Scarcity of housing, food, health care, and time creates desperation. Marginalized people with scarcity of these things, creating desperation, forces them into positions that make them vulnerable to harassment, to death, to uh, illness. Um, even on the hyper-local hyper level of politics, you have district judges, police, firefighters, business licensing offices, administrators who all make public policy that affect each and every one of us. Public policy and political sway allow people to lawfully own and operate businesses or not. Within my parents' and grandparents' generations, local policy didn't allow people of a certain identity, black people, to obtain mortgages or even purchase property in certain areas. You have public school boards that decide whether or not children can show up as themselves and learn in a safe environment free from harassment. And regardless of your identity, showing up with more money to fund support for your values means that you've already stepped into it with more political power. So to kind of close out this election day podcast, um, I hope everybody went out and voted. And if you didn't, I also completely understand why you don't feel empowered to do that. But I hope that the work that I do empowers you to make decisions and take the authority of your life, um, to have more agency, to become more independent so that you can live a life in line with your values. And in the world that we live in, in the United States, in the society and the economy that we have right now, having financial agency and independence comes from having more money. And I want to help my clients make more money and what gets measured grows. So to wrap up, that's kind of why I do what I do. That's kind of um, my political beliefs and how all that ties into the work that I do. No jail for any job. I support health care and people making their own decisions with their doctors and nobody else um, what to do with their bodies. I support bodily autonomy for everybody. I support you showing up in the identity and in the body that you're in. And I hope that whether you're starting a business, whether you own a business, whether you're working in somebody else's business as an employee, that you feel that you are empowered to create the life that you want to have that grants you access to the places where decisions are being made about your life. Uh, <clears throat> and that you can represent yourself and other people that need better representation. So that's all for today. I wanted to thank y'all for listening. And by the time this comes out, <laughs> election day is over. But if there are any runoffs, make sure you go vote. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one. If you are enjoying what you're learning on this podcast, please consider supporting me through a subscription on anchor.fm. Any donation amount is welcome, or you can simply share it with someone you know. You can also follow me on Instagram at alleaseaccounting and sign up for my email list at alleaseaccounting.com forward slash subscribe. Thanks for listening.